There is a big problem with that verse. Have you ever noticed that? Again, the verse, as you know, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Right? So that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, there is a big moral issue which we overlook because we are Christians and this is like the worst, right? Like if so I'll just read a comment by a very famous television host, uh, a comedian actually, but uh, he's a very funny guy, very, I mean, anti-religious, atheist, and he always makes fun of religion all the time, Bill Maher, uh, I don't know how many of you know, he has a talk show and he created actually a documentary called Religious or something like that, making fun of uh, religion. Uh, but sometimes I listen to some of these people, you know, sometimes they make sense and I, I want to hear what is the other side thing and how to. So this is what a comment he made, not particularly about this verse, but about the whole theology of the Bible, right? The whole idea of for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that. So this is what he said. So about Christianity, there is this space God. He is a single parent. He has a kid, and he sent his son on a suicide mission. Okay, so this is a comedian's take on that. That's right, right? The God of the Bible is a dad, but there is no mom. We don't know where the mom is. So he's right. Yeah, he's like a single parent, <laughs> and then he has this kid, <laughs> which is Jesus. And then he sent Jesus on a suicide mission. There is no way he's going to come back victorious or, you know, he's basically sent to be killed, right? What kind of religion is this? Uh, I mean, yeah, like if you don't believe in the Bible, if you don't understand what revelation is or what spirituality is, yeah, I'm with the guy, right? So now this is, again, the moral issue is, so if See, if I love ICA so much, what should I do? You know, if I love ICA so much, I give my daughters Hannah and Emma for you. It doesn't make any sense, right? If I love you so much, I should give myself, not my kid, right? Not my son, not my son-in-law or daughter, or it, it's not how it works. If, you, if God so loved the world, God has to give himself, not his son, right? Now, the whole point I'm trying to make, you know, you know what I'm talking about because you're Christians. Uh, are we are on a series on Trinity, the whole idea of Trinity, right? Um, so, Simran, if you, you can, you can put that first picture on when you get there. Yeah. So I just put it there. Um, the the whole idea of Trinity to me is not very complicated. If you ask me, call me naive, call me simple. Uh, but I've been on it for the last three weeks, and this is the fourth week. I only need 10 weeks to explain what Trinity is. To me, it is very convincing, very clear. I've never been confused about this at all. But leading up to it, you know, how do we uh, approach that issue? How do we arrive at the issue is very important. And that's the reason we are going through this series. So I, s I said this before in the class. One of the reasons church fathers had to define Trinity or conceive an idea like Trinity was because they struggled to understand the concept of the person of Jesus. They were not sure, well, Jesus was a man. Yes, he was a man. But he was he a God? Yes, he was God. So what is he? Like, how can a man be God? How can, how can God be man? This was the confusion that was happening, right? So eventually, they, so we will come to that next week, I promise. We will end this next week. Next we will talk about Trinity. But this week, and I want to focus on that, that picture I thought, you know, in so many ways explain what I'm trying to say. I've shown you this picture already. But there is this human side to Jesus and this divine side to Jesus. There is humanity in him and divinity in him. He is perfect God, perfect man. We have discussed some of this. We have already proved the divinity of Jesus, different witnesses. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. It's all very clear. But now, coming back to where we started, the point is, Christian idea of salvation which we read, John chapter 3.16, is the most important because it talks about the idea of 
Christian idea of salvation, right? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. So there are only two ways to look at it. If that verse has to make any sense, who is hanging on the cross has to be God himself. Otherwise, it will be the more barbaric act of history. Does that make sense? If God is not the one who is hanging on the cross, the Christian idea of salvation is, is cruel. God makes somebody to go and die because he loves the world. And so Bill Maher or somebody or another comedian goes to say, these kind of gods we had to call child protective service. Which basically says that, yeah, I love my... See, I can ask anything from Sunal, but the last thing he would give me is Tabitha or Bethany. Like, you know, that's, that's, that's what a dad is. He'll never, ever give his daughter or son, whoever. It's the same with all of you, right? So when God gave his only begotten son, we have already discussed the concept of what does that mean, son of God. It is a theological metaphor. We have discussed all that in the previous videos you can watch. But the point is, if Christ is not God himself, that verse doesn't make any sense. That's my point. If God created somebody so that we can die for us and God sent him so that, you know, okay, here you go, here take, all, you know, save the world and come back, that is very, very cruel thing to do. It's a cruel thing to do. That's the point of what they are saying. That's one of the reasons we are, you know, coming back to Trinity, that there is no way the Bible will make sense unless and until we understand the concept that, that Jesus is God himself. Otherwise, there are a lot of verses in the Bible is nothing less than cruel if we look from an independent, honest perspective. Are you following me? Now that, 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 that's an important point we had to get. So there is this verse, I, I love that verse, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. The act that is happening on the cross the act which is described in John 3.16 is not God sending somebody else, delegating somebody else so that he can go and die for the world and coming back. But God was in Christ. God was on the cross. God was hanging on the cross, taking the burden of humanity's sin. And that's the word says, God was in Christ reconciling the world to ourselves. That's why we say God was Christ himself. It, humanity and divinity come together. Okay, let me, let me just stay, step back a bit. And have you ever wondered, and I'm sure you have, but you probably don't want to ask this question, want to be polite, but why did Jesus or anybody have to come to this world and die for our sins? See, if I am God, if I, if, if I were God, I would have had a very easy solution for this, so I think. Sometimes I think I'm smarter than God, even though I don't say that. But I think I, I, I could have done, run this world in a much better way. You know, sometimes I, I think to myself, right? So if I were God, I would have said, well, Ajoy and Shanti, you have sins? Okay, forgiven, go, go. Next one, Sneha, come, forgiven, go. I am God, I can do whatever I want, right? Or the whole world. Okay, all your sins are forgiven, right? Isn't that, isn't that the... Yeah, why do we have to create this drama? Why do we have to, you know, th this whole, whole, whole uh, crucifixion, resurrection, all the stories, and you know, doesn't. So why, ha why God has to create this, 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 this cosmic drama which unfolded in in the history? So uh, you know, I, I know this is very basic, very basic, but it is it is important for us to sometimes go back to the basic. Okay, so bear with me here. And you must have heard this courtroom analogy. It's a courtroom analogy to explain salvation. So this is how it goes. Basically, and it kind of makes sense to me. So God is the judge, right? So I am, so let's picture this, okay. So I am the judge. I am, I am a judge, okay. And I am a just judge. I will never do anything, uh, nor, you know, I won't uh, close my eyes to injustice even for personal reasons. You know, there are a lot of perfect judges in the world, but we all have our own human side. But I am perfect, and I will not go sin unpunished, okay? 
And so I am a judge and I'm judging everything in the world and everything come to the court. And then one day a culprit is brought to my court. Okay. And God forbid it may never happen. But, you know, that happened to be my daughter Hannah. Okay. Now Hannah is coming and she has done committed a very heinous crime. And uh, I look at the law and she has to be punished. Okay. Let's say she needs to be sent to prison or she has to be given death sentence. Now, I as a judge, right, like I'm a judge, and I have to do that. I have to execute that punishment. Otherwise, I'm not becoming just. But at the same time, I'm not just a just judge. That's a little cool. I'm not just a just judge. I am also a loving father, right? So I look at my daughter and say, no, in my right mind, I can never ever send her to prison. I can never send her to, you know, uh, you know death, death row. I want to save her. I want to save her, you know, because I'm not just a judge. I'm also a father with a loving heart. Now, I come to this side, but when I am a loving father, I want to save my daughter, but then I cannot be a just judge. I can only be one of the two. Do you understand? This is called, uh, in theology, we call this a heavenly dilemma. A heavenly dilemma. So if God has to be judge and he has to punish the sin, which he has to, because he is perfect judge, right? None of us are perfect. We can be very just, but sometimes we can, you know, we can let something go, right? Like, you know, that, that's the way we are. But God cannot. There are certain restrictions because of his omnipotence. He cannot do sin, for example, right? He cannot do Certain things which we can. We can do certain things because God cannot do certain things because of his character, because of nature, because of his attribute, right? So, coming back, so this just judge want to punish the sin, but again, this God in, in himself, he is also a loving father, he wants to let this child go. And both of these things will ne not happen at the same time. You cannot punish a man and or punish a culprit and send that culprit, uh, release the culprit free. It's not logically impossible. This is where all the religions stumble. You take any religion, there is no, there is no solution for this. That's why all religions have this idea of karma. You know, karma, like the, in, the Indian word karma. The all religion, fundamentally, it's all about karma. We'll talk about it when we do the Hinduism seminar. But the point is, religion prescribe different kind of penance and ultimately you, you know, if you go back to the tradition, I'm coming from a very Syrian Orthodox church, you say, okay, go and, uh, you know, light the candles and, you know, go and say this many rosary prayers or go and uh, go to a pilgrimage and so you do, 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 do certain things so that you can somehow uh, blot out part of the crime so that you are still paying for what you did. Does that make sense? So that's why religion invented methodologies to, to kind of sort out this dilemma where God can execute punishment and do, you know, send, uh, send the, uh, release the prisoner at the same time. So then Christianity comes with the, a very interesting solution where the judge himself comes down from his seat. And if you have seen courtroom, and you, I'm sure you must have seen courtrooms, hopefully not the real courtroom, but in TV and all that, right? And so you can always see, judge is not just sitting with everybody else, like, right? He is, he is sitting always on top. So he's sitting on his big crown kind of bench, and he's sitting there and he's looking at his daughter or son standing there. So the judge comes down, from his throne, from his, you know, seat, and comes to the defense stand and says, okay, this is what happened. I'm going to bail out my client. I'm going to bail her out. And I am going to take the sins, or I am going to take the punishment on myself so that I can release this prisoner free. So the punishment is happening, or it is carried over to the judge himself who is in charge of this, this whole thing. And at the same time, the prisoner is released. Now, this is what is happening on the cross. So, in that case, the justice of God and the love of God manifest at the same time. Because there is no other way it can be done. Does that make sense? That's why it's called a dilemma. If God is just, he cannot be loving. If God is loving, God can be loving, but God cannot be loved. There is a difference between God being love and God is loving. We are all loving, right? 
But we are not love. Love is not the defining attribute. I am loving to everybody, but sometimes I get, I get angry too. Sometimes I hate everybody in the world. Sometimes that's who I am. That's my feeling. That's who I am. But God, God cannot be like that. God is not just loving. God is love. That means he cannot change. He cannot change his attribute. So, if God is just, he cannot be love. If God is love, he cannot be just. This is the heavenly dilemma. This is the predicament God had, the cosmic predicament. But on the cross, both the love of God and the justice of God is manifesting at the same time. Because God himself comes down, the judge himself comes down and takes the sin of humanity and he says, now I am setting the prisoner free. So the sin is already, the punishment for the sins are already executed. The, the, so the or, only thing that remains is love. Only thing remains is love. Right? So the law of God and the love of God comes together on the cross. And that's why that verse says, God was in Christ, hanging on the cross, reconciling the world to himself. He is bringing the world to himself. And, and that is the idea of salvation. That's why God himself had to come and execute this, this big cosmic sacrifice for, for our sins, for the sins of the world. That's what really makes Christianity extremely different from all other religions in the world. All other religions in the world, okay? So that's not the point again. So why did I say this? I want to talk to you a bit about the idea of incarnation. You, most of you are from India, so you know what that means, right? Incarnation. So incarnation is the process where the judge is coming down from his big seat and coming down to that witness, the, the defense stand, that process of judge emptying himself, he takes his gown off as a judge, and he takes his, you know, all those things, and, and then he comes down as a, and he's wearing that culprit's, or the jail, prison, uniform. That process of emptying of the judge is called incarnation. God, the judge coming down to the witness stand. Judge coming down to the ordinary people. And this is what is happening in the whole idea of incarnation. Or incarnation is where God comes in human flesh. And the word incarnation comes from incarnis. Carnis is a Latin word like, you know, carnal. You probably heard of the carnal means very fleshly desire. So that's where the word comes, incarnis. Like God coming down in human flesh. Or Eugene Peterson would say, God moving into our neighborhood. I like that. <laughs> God moving into our neighborhood. That, that's a much better way to say it. So, so God, God manifests himself in human form and coming down to the world as, as one of us. And that is what is happening in, in Christ. And that is, that is who Christ is. So that's why the most, another famous verses in the Bible, if you go to John chapter 1. Yeah, so you know this word, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word, as you probably know, in the Greek language, the word they used is logos. So in the beginning was, logos is a word very equivalent to in Hindu, you know, most of us have Hindu background, like, you know, we almost always, uh, you know, we use the word Brahman, like, you know, Brahman or Parabrahman, like, you know, which kind of means a universal spirit, or it's kind of the mind of God rather than a person himself. There's a Brahma and Brahman anyway, that's a Hinduism seminar. But, but basically, it's, it's a word with that kind of theological connotation. So the Logos is sort of a mind of God. That's the best way to express it. So in the beginning was the Logos, and the Logos was with God, and the Logos was God. And then, you know, the word came down, and everything that was created was created through him. Remember? Right? That's how that was. You know, I didn't want to read it because the, you know, it's the whole verse. So the first time the Logos came down to this world, the purpose of Logos coming down to this world, the word coming down to this world was creation, according to this, this theology. So first time God came down to do creation. And the second time, this is the second time, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Who was that? That was Christ. That was judge coming down. 
taking off his coat. It's still the same judge. It's still the same person. Nothing changes. It's, who, it's the same person, but he is wearing a different coat. He, he, he removes his godly, divine coat and puts on a human coat. And that's who, that's who Christ is. So second time, Logos came down to do salvation. First time for creation, and second time for salvation, and third time he is going to come back again for judgment. Right? Like he is going to come back. I mean, this is again the philosophical thought. But we know, so in, in, in essence, Jesus is God in flesh. Now, the reason I'm setting this up, and I know it's a little, you know, like a theology lecture. I'm setting this up. There are some verses in the Bible. Um, say, for example, I'll read this. John chapter 5, 19, where Jesus says, The Son of Man can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father is doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in the same manner. And there is another verse with John 5, 30, which says, I can do nothing. On my initiative. So there you go. You know, you have a, you give it to a Jehovah Witness. They will have a field day with these kind of verses. Oh, this is what you said God is? Like, you know, the God, see, look at what the God is saying. I can do nothing. I can do nothing. You know, it's just the Father. Like, you know, I, I'm just an inferior. But that's the way it sounds like, right? Does that make sense? So that's why, I mean, to, to understand this, we, we have to understand the concept of incarnation. If we don't understand the concept of incarnation, if we directly get into it, we get confused too. So that's why I'm, I'm kind of setting you up for, for some of this. And the, another word says, I do nothing on my own initiative, but I speak these things as the Father's taught me, John 8, 28. Then another word, Matthew 24, 36, where Jesus says, On that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So there are some of these verses which kind of shows that Jesus is somehow inferior or somehow uh, restricted or somehow confined in, in, his, in his capabilities, right? But the point is, when we understand incarnation, the fact that God, it's still the same God, but the fact that he removed his judge court. But it, he did that willingly. It's a self-imposed restriction. Okay? I'll give you an example. Like, you know, George Sivari is sitting right there. If I go and, you know, you know, I try to beat him up or something, right? And he will, he will hit me back, right? Like, or, you know, no, I won't do that. Somebody else comes outside. You know, nobody's going to play with him, right? Like, you know. But sometimes, so let, let's say Johnny, a Joy's younger son, goes and, Give him a, like, you know, like this, like a big punch. Do you think George Sivari will hit him back? No, he won't do that. I won't do that. Like nobody will do, he won't do that. But then we look at his, oh, look at him. He couldn't even hit, the, hit back a kid. Will, will we say that? No, because we know he can hit him back. He can hit him really hard. He can get, hit anybody in this congregation. But he did not do that. That doesn't show that he is somehow inferior. That shows that he is superior. That shows that he is a bigger man than all of us. Does that make sense? Because it's a self-imposed limitation. It is not because he was restrained by somebody else. He chose to do so. See, if the judge was forced by the president or somebody else to go down from his seat and do something else, that's a completely different story. So the judge himself decides to... So it's a self-imposed restriction God places himself to achieve the salvation of humanity or to solve the heavenly dilemma. Because there is no other way the heavenly dilemma can be solved. Not in a Jehovah Witness way, not in a Hindu way, not in a Muslim way. There is no religion can solve that dilemma unless and until we, we, we understand that it was God in Christ hanging on the cross reconciling the world to himself. Does that make sense? So it is a self-imposed limitation. He is coming down to a different realm of humanity and he imposes these restrictions on himself. And again, there is other way of reading it. So, so just, to, just to give you a picture, uh, I don't know how many of you see this uh, film. I, have a, I think I have a picture. Simran, is there a picture? Yeah, that's one. I don't know how many of you have seen this movie. Avatar, you know what Avatar means? You guys are from India, most of you. 
Yeah? Yeah. So you, what, what does avatar mean? What is the best translation for avatar? Yeah, I've been saying this all, all along. That, that's the word I was saying this all along. My sermon is about avatar. I just used the Christian terms, but the Hindu terms is avatar. Avatar means descent, which means coming down, God coming down. Interestingly enough, there are only two religions in the world that believe in incarnation. That is Hinduism and Christianity. Now, Hinduism, avatar is a very different concept. I'll again explain it in the Hinduism seminar. But in Hinduism, when God comes down, God is a pantheistic religion too. So even when God comes down, he, doesn't not, he does not always come down on himself. He can be a part God incarnation. Even there are a lot of uh, godly human beings are considered kind of avatars. And it can be, you know, even when God comes down as an avatar, God can also exist in other people and all that kind of stuff. Anyway, let's not get complicated. It's much easier to understand it as a story. When I, I watched this movie, um, it kind of, kind of made a lot of sense to me, the whole idea of how, how can Jesus be the son of God and the son of man at the same time? Or how can God exist in two different realities? So, so a bunch of U.S. Um, soldiers or explorers or something like that, they go to a planet somewhere out in the space. I think the planet is called Pandora or something like that. It's a blue planet. So everybody in that, uh, you know, they all look like blue and all that kind of stuff. And so they have developed this machinery where this U.S. soldiers will get into like a chamber then their whole soul or whole mind and everything, their entire being will be transported into this blue. So the, everybody who lives in the planet are blue kind of beings, a very different kind of beings. They look like human beings, but they are not really human beings. So their whole being will be transported into this blue people in the blue planet. So then they go around and do stuff and they, they do all this stuff in the blue planet. That's the main story. But that's all you need to know right now. So whenever this, when, when, when a U.S. soldier, the hero, goes into this chamber, he's basically, his, his soul or his being is transported into this blue person, and then he goes around in the blue world, he also exists in both realities at the same time. So he is here in the chamber as a U.S. soldier, but he is also out there in another body, walking around and doing stuff and exploring stuff. It's very interesting, very interesting, very cleverly made. And whatever this suffering or pain and, you know, sometimes they're going to fight and they get, you know, shot and all that, that pain will be experienced in this reality, in this chamber by the U.S. soldier. Okay? That's, that's very, very interesting. And, and also, you, you, can, you can picture this in our own, our, you know, when we see dreams, you know, most of us see dreams, right? When we watch dreams, and sometimes nightmares, or like, you know, bad dreams, or, you know, something we are, you know, we're thinking, and it's something very tense, and, you know, you have physical manifestation in our body, right? Like, the heart rate goes up, and, you know, I can see, sometimes Joanne gets a nightmare, and I, I, I feel that, you know, there, you know, she has a physical manifestation, the same way, me too, I just suddenly st get up, or, you know, my heart rate goes up, and I sweat, and all that. Actually, it, nothing happens to my body at that time because I exist in a different reality. That's what's happening in, in a dream, right? We are not there. Yes, we are there. Our body is there. But in our mind, we are part of another story. We are somewhere else. We are in another world. We are incarnate in another world. We are doing stuff in another world. But we are still here. We are here. We are here. Our body is here. So whatever is happening, there's a direct replication, direct, uh, you know, experience is in our human body. That happens to us in a way. In that way, in a, in a, in a very metaphorical way, it is sort of an incarnation for ourselves. We feel it in both reality. We feel it at the both things. In the same way, it's, I thought it was kind of very interesting that they showed, uh, you know, they picked the name Avatar and they showed the whole concept of Ingan. It kind of made, it became very clear to me when I watched that movie. Wow, okay, I can understand now Jesus or the God can exist in both different realities, both sides of the mirror at the same time. A son of God in one reality and son of man in another reality. And that's very possible. In a strange way, it, it, is, it is our own experience too. And that's what is brought down to the cross. And that's why the cross becomes that amalgamation of these two different sides of God. The love and justice. The law of God and the grace of God coming together on the cross because 
in cross jesus was god himself or god was in christ reconciling the world so even though we say that for god so loved the world that he sent his begotten son only when we understand trinity we can say that actually what it says is for god so loved the world that he gave himself that's what it means otherwise that's very bad that's a, that verse doesn't really make any sense at all so the point is god and jesus are the same entity and that's where we, they had to come up with this this idea of trinity anyway we are not going to go there and now but one thing to remember you know when we started the first couple first uh, some of the verses we read was isaiah saw the vision this majestic vision of god right isaiah chapter 6 you remember isaiah chapter 6 and he saw god and then john said oh what he saw who he saw was not god but jesus you remember john chapter you know 7 and all that you know you can go back and see that and then in the same way moses saw god a glimpse of god right a glimpse of he can only see from the back side but and then when you come to hebrews uh, the the writer of the hebrew paul Uh, apparently he says that it he was Mo- moses was be- was bearing the reproach of christ so moses what moses saw was actually christ uh, not just god but christ so it's the same person but the point is when moses saw god he couldn't even look at god right like you know because it's a physical he cannot handle the majesty of god he could only see see through uh, the cleft of a rock like a, through a keyhole because that god he saw was not in a relatable dimension and then when isaiah saw god it was in only a vision but do you know what is the first thing that comes out of isaiah's mouth who is to me who alas i can't believe that i am going to die you know this is he was sort of cursing himself because this is something unrelatable unrelatable that's who god was and that's who god is in that transcendent reality but that god chose to come down because he wanted us to relate to him he didn't want to be in that transcendent realm and sit on like a big chair and ask us to come with our you know come you know do our worship and go back but he wanted to relate to us so he chose to come down from his seat and remove his thro- he remove his robe or whatever and come down because he wanted to enter into a relationship that's why we called we call the christian god emmanuel which means god who is not up there god is right here with us god is with us and for achieving that very purpose god imposed on himself this this voluntarily voluntarily chose to limit himself on on some of this thing because when he lives in the human dimension he has to be in human realm reality right otherwise he cannot relate to relate to us and that's how some of that verses can be explained as we discussed last week he emptied himself though he existed in the form of god he d- regarded not to uh, uh, he he emptied himself and he became Uh, like a servant in that being in the likeness of man found as a as a servant and he became obedient to the point of death even the death on the cross because he wanted to relate to us he wanted to achieve salvation he wanted to reconcile the world to himself on the cross let's pray